Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, your Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. Joining me, Mr. Brendan Nunez. Brendan Nunez, what is what is happening here? Where's Sean Cunningham? Brendan Nunez from the Kings Pulse and the Kings Herald. Brendan, what's going on, man? Filling in. Yeah, not much. Uh, Kings Beat made a trade today. They decided they want to get younger, rebuild. Oh, 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 oh no! Shots fired! Oh, shots fired! Yeah. Sean Cunningham, no. shots fired! I'm glad to be here, James. It was a fun day. Yeah, uh, it is a fun day. Uh, NBA trade de- trade deadline is always a lot of fun. Um, but let's just take care of business. Um, we're doing something new. Uh, I don't know if it's working or not. Hopefully, it is. Uh, we're streaming on Twitch. Uh, we're streaming on Twitter. We would have streamed on YouTube, but YouTube makes you wait 24 hours before they let you do that. Uh, So we got to wait. So maybe next week we can do something like that. Um, But this will be available um, on uh, every every platform that it normally is as soon as we're done here. So uh, you're not missing anything if you're not watching it live. Um, It will be available afterwards. Uh, Just make sure that if you are watching on any of these platforms, give us a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe, go down into the, uh, the description down below, make sure to, uh, jump on the King's beat, get a subscription to the King's beat. Uh, if you can do a premium subscription cause it helps pay for the crazy content that we are producing. Um, we have comments coming in all kinds of stuff. We're not used to any of this. This is all new to me. Uh, but Brandon here, like he said, he is uh, a young buck who can, probably help me uh, get through some of this minefield uh, that is uh, the like crazy technology world. Um, So uh, Sean Cunningham, hopefully we'll be back very soon. Uh, He's got NFL coverage this weekend and all kinds of other things happening. Uh, So he uh, was unavailable today. Um, Hopefully he'll be back soon. So um, we got so much to talk about. It's crazy. Uh, Again, uh, Brandon Nunez is joining me. Brandon, why don't you tell them just to start the show just a little bit about yourself so they have an idea. You don't have to get too deep into you know your your origin story, but just uh, tell tell the crowd a little bit about yourself who don't know you. Yeah, um, I guess just somebody who always thought that my job needed to be something that I loved and. Uh, Three, always very into basketball. Three years ago, moved to Sacramento. I was a Kings guy, or I was a Celtics guy before, which has made me not the most popular when that was a new thing still. Um, and since I moved to Sacramento, just kind of hopped on board. This is right when Bagley got drafted and uh, started doing stuff here and there, writing about the team. Uh, you know, jump from Royal Payne, Kings Herald, um, and do a little bit of freelancing for the Sac B now as well. Um, King's Pulse podcast. I'm almost at 300 episodes at this point. Um, so I have a little bit of experience under my belt at this point. Nothing close to James Ham level or anything like this. Um, but yeah, I'm working to get to a, a James type t- James type of spot here. All right. Uh, those are lofty, lofty aspirations. <laughs> No. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, between Cowbell Kingdom, uh, NBC, Purple Talk, and now the Kings Beat, I think I'm like around 600 podcasts overall. So a lot. Uh, crazy. It's I, I've been uh, doing this for a long time, and you end up like just stacking these podcasts on top of each other. Like the Kings were supposed to stack days, but uh, did not. Um, all right, so we have so much to talk about today, and again, uh, thanks so much, uh, Brendan, for joining me. Um, we should also mention it, it's Brendan, not Brandon, and he is best friends with Tyrese Halliburton, the Indiana Pacers, Tyrese Halliburton. Um, they they plan on playing video games together and and such. Uh, I, I don't have those relationships with players. Um, I think they believe I'm old, which I I am by their standards. So. Uh, Brendan, we've got this, uh, this incredible trade that goes down on Tuesday, which Sean and I covered extensively. Um, but then we got to see it like on the court 
on on Wednesday night. Uh, we all sat courtside waiting to see if uh, Demonte Sabonis and Jeremy Lamb and Justin Holiday would actually jump on the court and play. We had no idea what to expect. Uh, it seemed like it was about six o'clock when Sabonis rolled out and started warming up, and it was like, "Oh, this looks good." You had got some quiet. Uh, Brendan is becoming an insider. He became he got some quiet insider information that Sabonis would play, uh, and then I I still like you get to game time. We knew the starting lineup. We knew Sabonis was in it. We knew that Justin Holiday was in it. Outside of that, I don't think we had any idea what to expect. So just what were your initial, when you watched Sabonis in those first couple of minutes, what were your initial takeaways and uh, anything surprise you? Yeah, surprising. Um, I, I think that the entire ball, the way that it was moving a, a, among everybody, um, you know, I, I think that it Sabonis is a big factor in that. But, you know, maybe also an aspect of not having some of the guys out there that are previously ball stoppers and Buddy healed Marvin Bagley. Um, but I think also Justin Holiday and Jeremy Lamb, like, moved the ball pretty well. We saw assists all over the board last night. And I think that just having, because, you know, Tyrese is a great playmaker in himself, um, but it being a different position in Sabonis rather than the other playmaker that was alongside Tyrese beforehand in De'Aaron just adds a new dynamic where you're able to hit the paint and it swings from left to right more naturally rather than uh, your turn, my turn. It felt like there was a lot of one or two passes um, in, in previous games and there were a handful of times in this first uh, game with DeMontis Sabonis where it's like, wow, I think everybody just touched the ball right there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think the the other thing is um, there's a lot of dribble handoffs we saw at the beginning of the year, and I think they kind of started to go away from it a little bit as Alvin took over. Um, but obviously that's an area that Sabonis is really good at, um, at, at operating there. And so often it was just the normal dribble handoff of uh, running to the three-point line rather than ever back cutting, like we heard this with Buddy Heald earlier in the year. And I think that just when, when guys are actually able to do that back cut and get rewarded for it, you're just going to see it all that much more often. Like Chemezi Metu was doing that a lot in the first quarter. He just became, he, he was a monster in that first quarter, um, a lot of it playing off Sabonis. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think a uh, long-winded answer is just like the ball moved really, really well. And especially for a guy that doesn't know the system or anything like that, they hadn't had a practice and you could tell that they're kind of overlapping and poor spacing, like, yeah, the ball moved really, really well. Yeah, so when I was watching Sabonis, like I think we've all seen Sabonis play quite a few times. I just don't think we'd ever seen him play in that kind of pace. And I think part of it was the excitement of the night where he just, I mean, he made some mistakes early, but his ability to rip down a rebound, it, like that, that wasn't a surprise. Uh, the fact that he like is so wide in the lane that, he clears out multiple people and allows others to get rebounds. That wasn't a surprise. What was a surprise was the way he grabbed a rebound and just like bolted. Like I, I was like, what in the world? Like I was expecting outlet passes. He became his own outlet pass. I mean, he just started running down the court and I, I knew he had ball handling skills. I knew like, but I, he moved like a guard and he was fast for a guy that big. I was totally surprised how quickly he got up and down the court. Uh, you talked about the the handoffs. I thought that was cool, but I also thought that um, when he stands at the high post and, and has a ball in one hand and starts moving it around, he just looks like his dad. It's just stunning. It really is. If you were around, I don't think Brennan was alive to see Arvidas Sabonis actually play in a game. Uh, but the way that Ar Arvidas Sobonis would just palm a ball and move it all over the place, that's what his son looks like. It, uh, to me, I love I love to see that. Otis Thorpe used to do that. You see a little bit of it with Jokic. I also like, Brennan, the way that he finishes around the rim. Like, we get this thing with Jokic where, like, he does all these weird little dumps around the basket. And it's hard to describe, but it never really looks like he doesn't go off the glass. He doesn't do 
like just a little floater. It's always something strange and different. And I saw that with uh, Sabonis. He also ripped down a bunch of his own rebounds and, and put him back. Um, I just thought, man, this dude's a complete player. And the other thing I really liked is Fox firing passes to him uh, when, I mean, first of all, he has incredible hands. That was that was crazy to watch. Uh, but also, I thought that when they did a two-man game, it wasn't a two-man game, which is, to me, the the best part because we're so used to a traditional pick-and-roll two-man game with Rashawn Holmes either getting the lob or taking a step back and doing the push shot or the guard doing going to the basket, something just with those two. Once they got in the two-man game and Sabonis had the ball, like all bets were off. He was looking for people all over the court. He's looking for cutters. He's looking for guys in the corner. He's looking to go back to the guy who just got him the ball. To me, it was so incredibly, incredibly like intelligent to watch. That It was intelligent basketball. And it's something that I think, in all honesty, we, we just haven't seen in a while. Like you miss it. You miss seeing basketball that's like such an incredible high level, right? Yeah. And I think that as they continue to play alongside one each other, uh, one another, like having this level of trust in, in their teammates is partially what is going to hopefully lead to um, some good momentum here and like a different brand of basketball. Um, you know, I think that even when Fox or, or Davion is in these pick and roll situations, like Fox is very seemed willing to very quickly dump it off right as Sabonis is starting to um, get going towards the basket with Rashawn. It's more of like a need to make sure he's a right around his spot. Um, and, and I think, yeah, just being more willing to do that and trusting in Sabonis and each other. Um, yeah, Sabonis was very, um, very intentional. It seemed like of on the court, making sure that he was, you know, hi- high fiving all the guys and um, looked like from our view that he was communicating pretty well, um, just trying to get acclimated and, and certainly seemed happy in post game and excited to be there. And I think that uh, the day that they made the trade with the first Minnesota game, De'Aaron had a good energy to him as well. Um, so I, I think the skill set adds some excitement and, and some new with this playmaking and rebounding specifically areas that were weaknesses earlier in the year. Um, and at the same time, off the court, um, the energy feels a lot better around this team right now. It's still early, but. It's funny you said earlier in the season. You mean like yesterday, like the day before. It's true. Like, <laughs> I mean, the it was bad, like leading up to it. And like, look, I think at the end of the day, what we have to see here is like a much larger sample size. But there's a lot to be excited about. Like I, I uh, from the way that, his teammates responded to him from the way that he was smiling and exuberant on the court. Uh, you know, guys all over each other. Everyone's having a good time. Everyone was up off the bench. It didn't matter if they were winning or not. I even like looked at that game and I thought it doesn't matter if they win or lose this game. Like the fact that you're even in a game when guys had never practiced together, they stepped on the court like maybe 50 minutes before the game and really knew that they were going to play. It was just crazy to see a group, a collection of players sort of like just pull together and find, find some joy together. And again, it's been so long. And then we we talked about the post game, um, Brennan, I'm going to play a clip really quick from, uh, from post game. Again, if I screw things up, you guys know, like it's because I'm not good at this stuff, but, uh, but hopefully some of this, you know, this will work and it is a very short clip, but I think it, it captures some of what we saw in post game really well. Since the second I made it to the NBA, um, I figured out the hard way this is a business, and I, I got traded on draft night. Um, and a year later, I got traded again, and um, just trying to find a, find, find a home, you know, uh, where I'm loved. You know, I want to come out and compete every day, you know, and I feel like I found it here. Um, I love it here, and I, I just want to keep playing and getting wins. It took DeMontis Sabonis like less than 24 hours to love Sacramento and want to be here the rest of his career. That's what I, I mean, like book it. Just just to sign him up right now. Um, he's not eligible for an extension until not even next summer, not even this summer, the summer after. Um, but 
he said a couple of things. Like he's been looking for an NBA home for a long time and he thinks he found it. He, I love it here. We love it here. Um, I, I also, one of the takeaways I, I got, it's something that I don't think I really thought about. And, you know, this is your first trade deadline going through while you're there, like close to people. Um, but he mentioned that he was so happy that it was three of them, that it wasn't just him by himself, that that made him feel more comfortable. Like he had at least people on the court that he, he knew where they would be. He knew what they liked. Uh, and then everything else, you know, will kind of play itself out. But this was a two guys that, you know, he joked around. Uh, one of them's really funny. And like, he was just like, what did you think about being around him and like that spirit that you saw from him? Yeah, I think that it seems like has a potential to be infectious. Um, there's, you know, I think also the bad spirits or energies that we got from this team a, a lot of the ones earlier in the year or like you're saying like a week ago even were kind of coming from buddy and bagley so i, I think there is also an addition by subtraction um but yeah when it comes to sabonis himself i mean i had heard that he wasn't like great with media um but didn't seem like that in the slightest like you said he seemed uh, more than excited to be there. I think the whole, you know, found a home is interesting because he's 25 years old and this is his third team. And for a player that's a two-time all-star at that point, it's kind of crazy that he, nobody's wanted to like give him a home feeling, but um, you know, it, his first team was, uh, he wasn't getting much opportunity. And then when he was traded to Indiana, um, it they didn't know that he was going to become this type of player. So I, I think this is the first situation where they know what they're getting of Sabonis being an all-star, a focal point, and understanding that and bringing that in um, has clearly got to be a good feeling for him. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that his energy that we've seen um, can definitely be infectious. Um, Jeremy Lamb, I, I think, did mention that he was traded by himself at some point earlier in his career, and yeah, it's way worse than having other guys alongside you. Um, Justin Holiday is an interesting player to me as well. Um, and he has a really good synergy with Sabonis. 24% um, of Sabonis's assists on the entire year have gone to Justin Holiday. He's assisted Justin Holiday way more than any other teammate. Um, they have a decent synergy. I, I think that, you know, can kind of fill that buddy healed role. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that having smart, basketball players who are also happy to be here and looking to build something with Sabonis and De'Aaron as those focal points um, can really start some positive momentum even off the court and, and on, on the court. Yeah, I thought it was cool. We waited a long time, just so people know. We, we waited, I think it was over an hour, uh, for those guys to come in and actually uh, join us. Um, and so we're just kind of hanging out. Alvin came in and talked, but then it was a long, long time. And then I went to go, uh, I went to go start my camera cause they said, Hey, they're coming in. And so I got up to go start my camera and I look back and like, there's this huge family there. Like already the family's here and people kept saying, well, his wife's from California. So, and it's like, look, okay. You know, big deal. Ca I mean, California is gigantic. There, like, you could live in a part of the state and never see another part of the state. State, so, uh, like, not a lot of people from LA like come up and hang out in in uh, Sacramento. But I thought it was really interesting that, like, it was a bunch of people. I don't even know who all of them were. Uh, you in, know, in number and, ten Sabonis Sacramento Kings jerseys. They were all sitting there lined up in their Sabonis jerseys, and they all looked excited to be there. Like, this is. Uh, we've heard that um, his wife really did not like the cold winters in Indiana. Uh, so I I'm hoping that this is like a long-term thing for the Kings. Um, but, you know, we don't know. I think what we do know, Brennan, is that it's on the Kings right now to continue to build out this roster, to continue to put pieces around Sabonis and Fox to keep them happy, to make them successful, to to do right by this group of players so they have a chance to succeed. And we saw some of that, but uh, before we get too deep into like the other trades that have happened, um, let's just finish up with these other two guys. Uh, you know, Justin Holiday, um, 
solid three point shooter. Uh, I think it's thirty seven point eight percent from three on uh, on almost seven attempts per game. Jeremy Lamb has been a guy who's like very very skilled as a scorer, but has had trouble with injuries throughout his career. Um, Justin Holiday is under contract for next year. I think six point four, six point six million. Uh, Jeremy Lamb's in the final year of a ten point five million dollar contract, and so he's an expiring contract, or he's a, a free agent to be. He's also a player that uh, Monty McNair drafted uh, as part of the Houston Rockets front office, and I think it was 2012. Um, he also got traded from the Houston Rockets, uh, kind of like Buddy, where uh, De'Aaron said the other night, uh, you know, damn, uh, damn, Buddy, Alvin traded you twice. Uh, that was just ruthless. Um, but uh, what were what are your initial thoughts on on uh, Justin Holiday specifically? Because he looks like a guy who defensively can can be you know really solid around the perimeter. Uh, you know he's the brother of Drew Holiday and Aaron Holiday. He's one of the three Holiday brothers. Uh, but he really does have a nice feel for the game, even if his uh, his shooting was way off in, in the first opportunity. Yeah, he was 0 of 6 in that first game and 2 of 11 from the field. I think he was kind of doing a little bit too much early on and then settled down a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that still it, there was that first quarter that was just rough all around for the Kings, and then they come out in the second and score 42. Um, so I won't hold that. Definitely not going to hold Justin's slow start against him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that he can supply three-point shooting and kind of fill that buddy role. Um, I, I don't know that view Holiday as some long-term solution to an answer at the two or anything like that. Um, he's 32 years old and, like you said, this year and next under contract. But I think that during that time, he can fill a starting two spot. Um, you need somebody that is going to be willing to put up threes at a decent volume um, and, and hit them at an okay rate, and Justin Holiday does that. I was... I was surprised by his passing here and there. I don't think it blew me away or anything, but it was um, there's there's one baseline drive I think attacking a closeout that stood out to me, and then he whipped it to the other corner. Um, just yeah, I mean I think that both, all three of those guys moved the ball really well, and I was definitely impressed by what Justin did there. And um, defensively, I think that he does all the little things right. I don't think that he's a difference maker there, but I think he's a contributor to a good defense um so I, I think that he fits there i mean that's definitely an improvement from where the kings were at previously um yeah i mean I, I think he's just somebody that can do all the little things right and fill a role of three and d that the Kings so desperately need to put around fox and sabonis um and maybe the most surprising thing to me is that i thought he was like really well spoken and easy to talk to when we got on post game. Yeah, I think that that was um you know, he kind of reminds me a little bit of um of Garrett Temple. And so to me that that was like it, as a player he reminds me of Garrett Temple. Like he's going to do a little bit of, of everything. He's going to do, you know, he might not be as good defensively uh, as Temple was, but He's super long. Um, he's got some potential to score. Uh, definitely doesn't mind hoisting up the three. I thought n none of these guys looked like they were shy. That was good to see. And you talked about uh, Justin um, really kind of like being extremely articulate and strong in, in his first opportunity to talk to the media. So we're going to play another clip here. And there's something that funny... If, funny that happens in this clip which i think it shows a different side of sabonis uh and and sort of his way of messing with jeremy lamb um but it's something that i, I think is cool but also listen to the uh the sage words of of justin holiday since the second i made it to the nba um i figured out the hard way to it got natural you think that will come no this is very very natural i know for sure for myself and then for these two um Again, having a guy like Domas in the middle that you can give the ball to literally on the break and all the rest of us run, and he's going to look for you and make the right plays, um, being fast is going to be easy for us. And then, obviously, we have Fox pushing the ball down. Uh, all of our guards, you know, Jeremy, anybody can get it and go and run. 
And in this league, man, if you can, you know, score quickly and get stops, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to beat us. I know how hard it's been for us to come in here. We literally had to like try to slow the game down, you know? And so the playing fast part, I think comes easy for us because we're smart players. We know how to play the game, but we're gonna look for one another. And the rest of the team is that way. Again, if you look at how many assists we had from top to bottom, I, I don't know the last time I've seen that many assists, you know, from each guy, not just one guy having all of them. So I think it's gonna work for us well. And Domas, and just just follow up on that a little bit, just for you. Yeah, that was a good moment. Um, he's sitting there ribbing his teammate, his, you know, Pacers teammate and now Kings teammate, uh, because I don't think Jeremy Lamb usually gets that many assists. He's not a big a big pass guy. No. Um, but overall, like, the feel of these guys, uh, I think Holiday captured it really well that, like, we're smart players. And there are also seasoned players. Sabonis isn't, you know, he's only 25, going on 26 at some point. This uh, this summer, I think. And, but the other two, these are veteran guys, and th- this Kings team has had a has had a lot of trouble with veterans coming in and actually making an impact. On occasion, it seems like guys who are brought in at the trade deadline seem to make much more impact than guys who are brought in during the off season. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but it seems like guys like Kent Bazemore came in and instantly made an impact. Anthony Tolliver and Kent Bazemore had like a team uh, players only meeting like two games into their tenure in Sacramento and really just like told the guys like, you're so much better than this. What are you doing? You know, we've got to work together. And I thought it was very impactful. Uh, I kind of see that with it, with him as well. I think we saw it a little bit from Mo Harkless last year. Uh, But now you're seeing like these veterans that can actually have a voice, make some adjustments um, and, the basketball IQ just feels like it jumped considerably. A- a- am I wrong there? Because that's what it feels like, uh, Brendan. Oh, it definitely did, especially when you're considering the starting point. Um, yeah, Uh-oh. I mean, it- it's a it's a big <laughs> improvement for sure. And you know, I, Justin also or Alvin pointed out to us uh, the night before that he had coached Justin earlier in his career, and, and which I didn't realize uh, when he was at Golden State, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of asked Justin, you know, um, what did you know going into it about Alvin and just that they were going to run like crazy. And uh, we, we've definitely heard Alvin preach that all year. And, uh, and yeah, he also played with Harrison Barnes in Golden State, which I hadn't realized. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, like you're saying, having that sort of voice, maybe potential um, slight leadership and, and a jump in IQ and and just doing all the little things right. I, I think even keeping the ball moving, um, I, I know I've talked about assists and ball movement a whole lot, but I think understandably so. Um, they had 18 assists in the first half last night. Um, it was The ball was moving amazingly, and it, it's less of making an amazing pass when it comes to a Justin Holiday or Jeremy Lamb and more of a they're not dribbling the air out of the ball and stopping the flow of the offense. Yeah, I think the interesting point I'll bring up too is that uh, Sabonis finished with five assists, and uh, De'Aaron Fox, I think, finished with three, and the Kings as a team finished with 32. So your primary ball handlers, like, they only had a quarter of your assists. They only had 25%. I mean, that's stunning that the Kings were able, everyone was moving the ball. And I think we were, like, slightly stunned. We we got to the the media room and Avery gave us our box scores, which is always like a, an adventure of the night. Um, when he's not taking selfies of himself, he does give us box scores. Uh, shout out to Avery. Um, but uh, Davion Mitchell, eighteen points, seven assists, seven rebounds. Like you didn't even see it happen. Like what in the world? Where did that even come from? And I think that was the cool thing that nothing really felt all that forced except for when you took Sabonis off the court and all of a sudden we went right back to the same same exact motion offense that we've seen all season long that looked clunky and even worse after you pulled Sabonis off the court. And it's not a dig on Rashawn Holmes or uh, or the guys that are there. It's just that's the offense that they've gone under that they've had all season long. And then we got to see something different and it was fun and it was exciting 
uh, you know, guys were flying up and down the court. They're playing like pace. Like we keep hearing, let's play with pace. I, all of a sudden we see people playing with pace. I was totally s- stunned. I was stunned to see so many things, so many things throughout the night. Um, you know, and, and I think that this is something that they can build on. I don't know if this team is going to be uh, a winner. They've put themselves in such a deep hole to climb out that uh, we have no idea what this is going to look like. The final 25 games, I mean, it's it's a full-on sprint at this point and a sprint with a bunch of guys that don't know each other that well. Um, but we do have some road games, the all-star break, all this stuff wrapped around where they're going to spend a ton of time together. And I think it, those moments can be galvanizing, but this team has to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, yeah, uh, just I, I in case, that, go ahead. I think it's exciting and it, it's easy to, to like be excited about what we saw yesterday. And there were aspects of, oh, just this is new. And hopefully this is something they can keep up with what we mentioned, ball movement. And uh, yeah, I think playing unselfishly. But at the same time, how often is Chemezi Metu going to play the way he did in that first quarter? How often do you get 30 points from Harrison Barnes? Like, I think some of it is a product of playing alongside Sabonis. I think those guys benefited from that. Um, but I guess that's just me trying to pump the brakes a little bit and not wanting to get too excited. I, I see the blueprint for sure, but I think there were a couple things where I'm like, this might have just been a little bit of an outlier at the same time. What do you mean, Brennan? I mean, if Justin Holiday hits all of his threes, they win by 40. It's true. <laughs> uh, okay, so if you're just joining us, we're trying something new here on the King Speed Podcast. Uh, we're on Twitch, and we are on Twitter uh, slash Periscope. Uh, we will have this available on YouTube uh, and and in audio form, like always. Uh, go ahead and and hit the the like button, the subscribe button, whatever buttons are down there that you can hit. Just sit there and like tap and keep hitting buttons uh, that are good, not the bad buttons. Um, and uh, and Brendan is filling in. Uh, we got Sean Cunningham is out today, uh, and Brendan is nice enough to to jump on board and join me. And I I think. The best part about having Brendan here is um, if anyone has watched uh, post game, has watched like Sacramento media over the this season, they've realized that um, Brendan had this weird relationship with Tyrese Halliburton, and not weird as in like you know it just it you guys instantly formed this this bond, and it was over um, I think you asked uh, Luke Walton where you could, where he was going to hide Halliburton on defense. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because they were, they were playing, playing Charlotte, you know, Charlotte or Toronto. Was it Charlotte? It, yeah, it was Charlotte. And I was like, yeah, how do you hide him when there's four perimeter threats? Yeah. And, and Ty heard this and was like, bro, you, you talking about hiding me? You know, that's not very nice. So, um, you guys developed this relationship though. It's fun. It, it was, uh, he would come into every post game and, and rib you, uh, and ask you how his defense was. Um, when his defense was bad, he would come in and tell you I was horrible. And, uh, just, um, I know you're, you're new to this, but how unique was that for you? Because you went from like a guy coming in the door to all of a sudden, you kind of like you have this weird buddy uh, like comedy act with uh, with Tyrese Halliburton. Yeah, it was it was definitely fun. Um, happened very quick, and yeah, I thought it was funny that I did I make those comments to Luke, and it was a couple games later that Tyrese decided to say something about it. It's not like Tyrese was in the room and heard this and responded or anything when I initially said it to Luke. Um, so I thought that was kind of funny, and also the same day. Um, I sat by Sam Amick for the first time and was kind of picking his brain about a couple of things, including building relationships. And he was, you know, giving me advice. And, you know, honestly, it'll probably take a while. Don't expect anything to happen this year. And then the same night, Ty started uh, singling me out and talking to me. So it was a little bit of funny timing there. And, um, yeah, it's just – he's just joking around and uh, – it was, yeah, I, I think it was friendly that I like to kind of talk a little bit of crap sometimes. Like most of, you know, you said when he played bad defense that he would let us know. He would, but a lot of times if he played bad defense, he wasn't showing up. 
and uh, I definitely made him not showing up at, to the games, but showing up to post games. Um, and I made sure to give him a hard time about that a little bit here and there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that Ty is just very, like, I guess, playful and joking around and in a loose spirit. And um, yeah, ha, ha, just made light of the situation, but at the same time was using it as motivation and it's not like I was out of line. I mean, they're hiding him. It, it is what was going on here. So <laughs> I don't know that they have the guys to hide him in Indiana. We'll see how. Yeah. So, yeah, I think all the guys fun. you hit him are they're here in Sacramento now. You can't you can't hide him that well. I, I mean, I guess Miles Turner. Uh, I, I think he's going to be really good with Miles Turner. Now uh, we we bring up uh, Halliburton because um, you know first of all it's probably going to be one of the last times we do bring up Halliburton for a long time. Um, but he spoke to the Indiana media today, um, and I, I, he's in his feelings a little bit. And I don't blame him 100% because I think everything he had been told leading up to Tuesday was that uh, that he was going to be built around here in Sacramento, and then all of a sudden he was shipped to Indiana. And uh, I know he was very emotional that day. I know a lot of the players were emotional. I know it was a hard day. It's a hard day because... He's so incredibly likable, and I'm gonna play a clip of him in Indiana, and um, like you can tell that his feelings were pretty hurt. Tyrese, two weeks ago, you were saying how much you wanted to help right the ship in Sacramento. Is there any sting with not getting an opportunity? And how do you, I guess, move past that and start this new chapter? Yeah, no, I mean, they didn't want me. Uh, they, uh, they had, they, you know, went a different direction, and you know, it's part of the business, so. Uh, you know, it happens. I'm just excited to be here, excited to get going. Trying to say, trying to say no, I guess I can imagine it's hard to, to try to buy in somewhere else or try to trust another organization after they give you like the promise you I know you'll be in the future. I guess how do you try to buy in here and look toward the future? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's scary, right? You know, I put a lot of a lot of love, a lot of trust in Sacramento and kind of immerse myself in the community and with the people and you know they, they just you know got rid of me but you know it's part of the part of the business i think that's kind of my part of my best trait you know what i'm saying is uh you know it's, it's, it's like it's like somebody who just loves hard you know what i'm saying like i i want to be here i want to be a part of it and uh you know it can be my the biggest upside but it can be a big downfall too you know what i'm saying and it, it hurt when i got traded because you know i loved i loved being there and i love the people but you know coming here i'm gonna do the same thing you know what i'm saying they've showed me none but love since i've gotten here and they've they're another organization taking a chance on me when they have no reason to. So I'm going to put everything I got into it. Yeah, that's tough, Brennan. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he's a young guy. I think that's part of it, right? And, and he's somebody that was always very up or down based on how that game went, uh, whichever game we were talking to him afterwards. Like, if they played well, he was going to come out and – ask where I was at because he happened to have a steal in that game. Um, if he played poorly, he didn't want to talk about it. And he's rolling his eyes with his hood on, uh, not rolling his eyes disrespectfully. Like he's just very affected by wins and losses. And that clip, it feels like he's talking right after a loss. Like I, I there's definitely a, um, yeah, I mean, almost a just overwhelmed sense to kind of, the way that he's talking there and the whole they didn't want me quote is uh is certainly certainly something but i get where he's coming from like he said you know building relationships with everybody here like he said immersed himself in the community and all that like i i, I understand why it's a lot um but you can definitely see it in that clip yeah i mean ty was at high school football games every friday night a, a bunch of when they weren't playing he he's he did immerse himself in the community he is a very very good young man and I, I feel for him because um, you're always going to take this personal. And uh, like we talked about this on D'Lo and Casey today, uh, everyone got so excited about how well he played over the last like month. Maybe even, I think it's December 1st to when he was traded. His numbers are spectacular. Like he's averaging, you know, I think close to 10 assists a game. He's aver I mean, He was really, really good. And I think everyone looked at it and thought, oh, they're going to build around him. The Kings, like, subtly, like, I had conversations all around. Uh, they were putting out all signals that they were going to build around Fox and Halliburton. Um, but I think when you saw him keep getting better and better and better, and you could look at it two ways. You could 
you can think, oh, great, he's we're going to build around this kid. Or you can look at him as a really, really valuable player to trade. He kept increasing his trade value with every game. And I think the one thing that the Kings looked at that possibly from the outside they weren't looking at is that it didn't matter how well Halliburton played, they still lost. They lost all the time. And it wasn't because of Ty, but it was a very clear indication that whatever you have here is not good enough. And if he's going to be able to get you a two-time 25-year-old all-star big man that can change the whole complexity of your franchise, you have to do it. Like, I, I feel bad for Ty. There's no question that on, you know, February 8th, two thousand. 22 the sacramento kings got the best player in the deal there's no question whether that's still going to be the case three years from now we don't know but a lot of people who are convinced that halliburton is going to go on and be like a 20 and 10 uh point guard that's possible and i would just respond with sabonis is he hasn't even really reached his prime and he's he averaged what 20 points, 12 rebounds, and almost seven assists a game last season. Like, this is a next generation big. This is like there's Jokic and then there's Sabonis when it comes to passing big men. Like, he's the next step. And and after that, the, the fall off is dramatic and steep, and no one is even remotely close. I mean, this is such a talented player. And at the end of the day, man, you got to give up something to get something, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that Anybody would have been beyond satisfied if Tyrese Halliburton would have eventually became as impactful of a player as Demonis Sabonis. Like, would have exceeded any sort of expectations had, I think, even at the current stage that with the growth that we've seen from Ty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I understand it. Um, I also understand the idea of team control. Um, that kind of is where some people are are, are maybe more skeptical um, because, you know, Sabonis has two years after this when Ty is just year two of his rookie deal. Could Ty could have been around for six more years of team control, um, roughly. So I, I, I do understand that, but also this is De'Aaron Fox's time is right now. Um, and if you are trying to capitalize on, on the talent that De'Aaron Fox is, that Sabonis is ready to do that right now. And while I was somebody that maybe believed Tyrese and De'Aaron could have figured it out as a pairing, um, I think it's unquestionable that Demonis and De'Aaron are just so much better of a fit alongside one each other. Yeah, I even, like I, I, I said this a couple of times, I look at the pairing of Sabonis and Fox like in the same way that I look at the pairing of Miles Turner and and Ty, I think those two are going to go really well together, and Fox and and Sabonis are going to go really well together. And I just don't think that there's any way to blend. Like we weren't seeing the blend, and it wasn't leading to a beautiful basketball and b wins. Like it didn't matter how well Ty played, how many assists he had, uh, how well he set up his teammates you're still getting clubbed every night. And that's something that, you know, at the end of the day, I, I this team, not only did they get an all-star, but I don't know if you watched what Sabonis was doing to uh, Carl Anthony Towns' ribcage the entire night. Like, that is one tough dude. He doesn't mind mixing it up. He was jabbing elbows all night long. This is a physicality that the Kings have been missing. He brings it. Holiday brings it. I'm not sure. Lamb is more of a finesse player. Um, but, like, you at least added two guys who are, are impactful as far as their physicality. And while it's not a stat that we measure, like, in, in pre-draft, physicality should be. Because we've seen guys that, like, lead in bench press and then and then get pushed all over the court. You know, like, it, get waved. it's, it, yeah, it's a, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that that's a, a great point. Um, and, and you know what? That's a good segue, Brennan Nunes. Uh, the Sacramento Kings made another trade on um, on Thursday morning. And to be honest with you, it's 
another home run from Monty McNair in my book. Uh, like I'm not like the the Halliburton and Sabonis deal. It hurts, but I understand it. Uh, the next trade that happens, I don't understand it at all. I don't understand how Monty McNair just turned what everyone in Sacramento believes is the expiring contract of Marvin Bagley into Dante DiVincenzo, into Josh Jackson, and into Trey Lyles. And I know Trey Lyles and Josh Jackson are on expiring contracts, and uh, but Dante DiVincenzo, a year and a half ago, the Kings had traded for traded Bogdan Bogdanovich for him. And now you're getting him for an expiring Marvin Bagley that you can't get rid of fast enough? Like, Brennan, what what type of sorcery is this? Like, what in the world just happened? Who knows? Uh, something, uh, Monty is getting a lot of credit after I think people were very on him, understandably so. Um, and I think Lyles has a team option next year for uh, $2.6 million by the way. Yeah, it's a um, team which, option, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lyle's certainly not the focal point of the deal. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that from doing a little bit more of diving into how DiVincenzo's been recently, because uh, in their game three of the, they being Milwaukee's game three of the first round of the playoffs last year, he went down, uh, tore a ligament in his left ankle, and that's on May 27th, and then he doesn't come back. He was set for December 15th of this year, and right before he was ready to go, he ended up going into health and safety protocol, had another 10 days, and then he came back on Christmas. And in the 17 games he's played since he's come back, I just don't think he's been himself. Um, and all likelihood, he's going into restricted free agency. I think it would have been difficult for Milwaukee to – to retain him or it's not somebody that they necessarily in in my mind would probably prioritize when it came to um finances and um yeah i mean right now be and a lot of this has to do with divincenzo still coming back from injury and needing to get into a rhythm i think guys like grayson allen and pat connington are playing better than him and and they had a hole at the center with brooke lopez's complication um so i, I think since milwaukee is very focused on right now that it made Dante's price lower than what I would have expected. And um, yeah, I mean, this is the, again, another 3 and D piece that I think that mold is so important to get around Fox and Sabonis who aren't great shooters themselves and, and both need to get to the basket. So um, yeah, I think as I do dove into DiVincenzo a, a little bit more, I was again, like pump the brakes a little bit. Um, I, I think the potential is there, but I think there is also a, yeah, I don't think it's for sure that he's a starting caliber player in the league. Like, I think there's a, there's a really good chance. I mean, again, you know, to counter that, he played 66 games for the team that won the championship last year and, and started those games. But since he's come back, he's looked really rough. He might not have the same sort of pop. Um, but no matter what, this was just me trying to figure out why Milwaukee was willing to move on. Um, but no matter any sort of potential asterisks, because he could come back from this injury. And if you're getting the player that you saw last year of playing stellar defense and hitting almost 38% of his five three-point attempts a game, um, can be the one to kind of initiate the offense in spurts. I don't think he's a great passer, but I, I do think that he is decent in that aspect. Um, if you're getting that and all, all you gave up is Marvin Bagley, who was probably walking this off season, no matter what I would assume. I mean, it's, it's a great move. High basketball IQ player, strong defender when he's healthy. Uh, he shot better in the pros than anyone thought he would. Um, but like super, like he's athletic, he's fun. Uh, I think, again, he's one of those players that when you watch him with Sabonis, you're going to be like, oh, man, like, where did this guy come from? And I, I think, like, the funny thing is, um, I think Sabonis is one of those players that makes a lot of other players money. You know, he's a guy that makes you look better than you are a lot of the time. And uh, and I, I think we saw that in game one. Like, Chimazimetu. you know, yeah, Chemezi Metu just looked 
I mean, he had, I think, five dunks in the first quarter. Well, he would have had five dunks, but they called the one back at the at the hammer put back at the at the end. Um, they gave him the goal ten to make up for it. Yeah, not all of that was on Sabonis. It was on the fact that Sabonis does a bunch of hockey passes. You know, he's the assist guy. He's the guy that the assist to the assist. Um, so I, I really think it's it's interesting to uh, to watch how this team's going to develop. But I really do like that addition. And then you know, Trey Lyles is a guy that uh, I like not in a perfect way. Like there is a possibility that Trey Lyles actually looks really really good at the power forward position as a floor spacer for this team. I would have preferred that the Kings went out and, and did more to try to get PJ Washington. Uh, maybe that wasn't it just, they couldn't get it, get it to happen. Um, so I think that there was potential there that would have made even more sense. But Trey Lyle is a guy who really can shoot it uh, historically. Um, he, he is a very budget contract for next year. Um, but I think like 33.6% from three, you know, I look at him and I think of him as a player archetype. He's a guy that you're going to plug in there and you can say, hey, how does this look with this type of player? Can we go get a better version of him? And I think the answer is yes, but at least you have sort of a crash test dummy to put over there for a little while, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think that um, a spacing four is what this team is needed. You you know, I think that the guys that they've been thrown out there at the four, a lot of times they've ended up prioritizing rebounding. We heard that with Metu earlier in the year. Um, that was actually right before Luke was moved on from. Marvin obviously supplies that. If they're throwing Harkless out there, it's for the sake of defense. But none of those guys were respected from three. Um, so I think fully getting spacing out there while also being a decent rebounder at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I, I like your description there of, an archetype and and Lyles is interesting because he has stretches of putting it together like offensively I think he can be a very well-rounded player um sometimes the shooting is streaky and I think there's also going to be frustrating moments and who knows how much run he really gets um but there's moments where I, I think that he puts it together in in San Antonio he had a stretch at the beginning of the year um he, he fits Sacramento from the point of, uh, did you know that I, I realized today he was, it was tweeted by Shams last trade deadline that he was included in a trade for JJ Redick. Um, and he was going to be headed to Dallas and then it ended up getting backtracked and he never moved. So the Kings just love these dudes. They got one that they should have traded for in the first place and it fell through they're like, who else in the league was supposed to get traded and did it at some point in their career? We got to go get them. And there we go. Yeah, and I was surprised. Uh, Trey Lyle is only 26 years old. Like, there's still room for growth here. There's still time for him to get more consistent and stuff like that. Um, I, I think we're just going to have to, you know, see how he how he fits. And I actually believe that Mo Harkless is actually going to get plenty of time here for the Kings once he's healthy. Uh, the ankle injury, we'll see. We'll see how many games he misses. Um, but he's a very, very good cutter. And I know someone put out a stat. He's like the number one cutter in the league or something, like the highest percentage. What is that stat? Do you have that stat for me? I do not. I'll take uh, it. Best cutter in the league. That's all we need. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, well, um, when it comes to uh, Sabonis, that's what you need. You need guys that, that cut. And And, you know, saying that, I think that was a, the one thing that I, the Kings cut with purpose. Like, and it started with Sabonis. Sabonis would set a screen and then his cut to the rim was with purpose. You were like, holy cow, that's, that dude's going to run someone over. And then Fox kept feeding him with those pocket passes. I, I, I really think it was interesting to watch. Uh, but, you know, I think we're seeing a team that like, if you're going to play with Sabonis, you better, you better move. You can't just do a jog through. You can't, you know, like take your time. If you're cutting, cut hard and, and be ready to catch the pass. Yeah. And I think that getting rewarded for doing that is just going to encourage them to keep going with that. I think Harrison is a guy that is really going to benefit from that. Um, I, I think that Harrison can average 
20 points and, and still be efficient. I don't know that I'm expecting that for the rest of the year, but I think that he's that type of player and, and he's well-rounded, he's versatile offensively, but when he's being asked to create his own looks on occasion, that that's where some of these complications arise. And, you know, beginning of the year, Harrison was playing amazingly. And then he just kind of slowly starts to fade out and have these games where you don't feel him as much. And I think that when the ball is moving well and there is a flow of the offense where everybody's touching it, Harrison's going to have more opportunities that he recognizes where um, he doesn't have to go search for his shot. Instead, he's going to end up with the ball in his hands and recognize an opportunity that's already right in front of him. And th that could just enable Harrison that much more. Uh, we got a funny, a funny uh, note here in, in the chat. We've got uh, Salamanders, Sal Salamander, uh, I guess, uh, super team, just 24 through 26 <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah um yeah josh jackson like, included yeah and, well josh jackson turns 25 today like happy birthday go to sacramento yeah and uh i think he's gonna be okay with that uh to be honest with you because he's a guy who uh did go to a year of prep school here in napa um so mm. he is he's been around this area uh he does know this area um he was athletic, picked over fox he was picked uh, with the fourth pick in front of De'Aaron Fox in 2017 NBA draft. Uh, that was a mistake. Um, De'Aaron Fox is a much better player. Josh Jackson, to me, is just a throw-in in this deal. We'll see what happens. Um, there's possibility, again, that you look at him as a player archetype of a guy like, I don't know, Kelly Oubre? Like, can he be a Kelly Oubre type? Uh, I think that pace is something that can hide a lot of Josh Jackson's um, sort of deficiencies uh but um he's also like he's he's gonna need to calm down a little bit um and then like brennan like closing the chapter here on uh the marvin bagley the third um like era of king's basketball which basically was a lot of injuries a lot of struggles all that stuff uh yeah um i'm glad he found somewhere else to go and that's not like a dig on Marvin. I'm glad he he gets to go start over, and he probably gets to start over on a team that's going to give him lots of opportunity because they're not good. Um, and I really do think that this is a good situation for him to go and maybe find himself and maybe build some value, even if it's in limited stretch down, uh, limited time down the stretch here. I think he was playing a lot better this year. Like we saw him within the flow of the offense. Um, I think his numbers don't look as good as whatever his peak year was while he was in Sacramento. But um, yeah, when you're watching him play within the flow of the offense and they're not forcing these these post ups where he's taking these left jump jump hooks every single time, um, he he looked like he fit in out there more often this year than I think we had seen before. Um, There's still Obviously, growth that needs to be done, but Bagley's still really young, um, has a ridiculous athleticism and length to him. He was the guy, for sure, when I was first around the guys this year, where I was like, holy crap, Bagley is so tall, so tall, um, and a ridiculous athlete <laughs> with that height. Like, I think there's some guys that expected to be tall, obviously, right? But, and, and you know, Bagley's tall to an extent but that yeah that one was the one that shocked me the most for sure um you know the other guy um damian jones his like waist is up here like that dude must have like a i don't even know like a 40 46 inch inseam like that dude is his legs are so tall um yeah uh, you'll get used to that you'll get used they'll bring in taco fall and you'll be like Oh, right. oh, or um, Sam Bular. Yep. Uh, one of the biggest men I ever, man, Aaron Gray. That was, I think he's seven two, but huge, huge, huge man. Uh, Grizzly Adams, like that, just a bite, gigantic, barrel chested, big, gigantic guy. Uh, very nice, but like a gigantic man. You'll get used to that, like. Jason yeah. Thompson was a big dude. Yeah, and you know, you 
the whole time you're looking up and he like he has size 20 something 22 shoes um yeah yeah i i've yeah. It, it sucks you're not in the locker room you don't get to have that experience um okay let's let's bust through one last thing um before we get to the business of basketball um and yes we're doing the business of basketball with with brendan just because sean's not here it's not like we're going to just skip the business of basketball um so we have this odd situation that just happened where the kings just brought in a two-time all-star to play center and that doesn't bode all that well for oh yes we did skip the part that Jemias Ramsey and Robert Woodard uh, were waived this afternoon. Uh, Brendan brought that up, so let's start there. Um, yeah, sorry, it, I thought it, that's where you were going. It, no, no. In, in <laughs> order to okay, I'll just start there. In order to make the trade with uh, Marvin Bagley, Marvin Bagley, again, a guy who is going to a city by himself. Uh, unfortunately for Marvin, he's getting traded by himself. Uh, Marvin it's got Corey Joseph. Yeah, he he will have Corey Joseph there, so that's good. Um, But uh, the point was that it was a three-for-one. And so in the NBA, when you make a three-for-one trade, you can't just bring all the guys onto your roster and then decide who to waive and and waive one of the new players. You have to waive players on your roster in order to create space, or you need to trade players in order to create space. So because the Kings didn't do a different one-for-three trade, uh, their three for one force them to kill two roster spaces, and uh, unfortunately for Robert Woodard and Jamias Ramsey, uh, that meant that they're out of a job. They walk away with the rest of their paycheck. Uh, I think the Kings owe Robert Woodard three hundred thousand for next year as well. He had a, a slight guarantee on his on his contract, um, but I'll also point out that two way players are not eligible for that. They don't count as one of your fifteen man roster. There is no such thing as a 17-man roster, which I see all the time. There's a 15-man roster in two two-ways, uh, and up to two two-ways. You don't have to have both two-ways. Um, so I bring that up because, uh, you know, there wasn't anywhere for these guys to go. They were It was either the Kings cut Woodard uh, and Ramsey, or they chose a veteran to cut, and, uh, you know, that they chose to go this path. The problem that they have is, like if there was someone else you would cut, Chemezi Metu is on a non-guaranteed. Well, I mean, this, his his contract is guaranteed for the rest of the year, but he's not under contract next year. Damian Jones, same thing, not under contract for next year. Um, but Alex Len and Mo Harkless and Terrence Davis, they all have contracts for next year. So you couldn't really waive one of those guys. I guess you could have done something with like Jeremy Lamb, but if you're going to cut Jeremy Lamb, to keep either Jemias Ramsey or Robert Woodard, then you're probably not managing your assets correctly. Uh, does that the all make sense? The only one that stood out to me was Josh Jackson. Well, yeah, but you can't... You had to use Josh Jackson to make the trade, and then once Josh Jackson got here, you can't bring in Josh Jackson and then waive him. Okay. You have to waive someone before to open up the roster spot for the three-for-one. That's the problem. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah you, you can't absorb a contract... You can't go up to 17 contracts or 18 contracts and then cut back from there. You have to create space in order for guys to fit into the into the deal. So that's why the Kings worked tirelessly all day long to try to get another trade that would have balanced the roster slightly differently. So either they would have traded one of the one or two of those guys or they would have done a different deal where it's like a 2 for 1 or or one for two, uh, one for three, and and they could have created like a way to get around having to wave these guys at the last second. Um, but that brings us, uh, Brendan, to to really um, the other question that I have is, what exactly do you do with Rashawn Holmes? And and I'm just gonna let you run because this is a a very strange situation that I don't think we've seen in a while where uh, you have a a guy who just signed a four-year contract in the offseason he's your starting center and then you went out and signed a and traded for a 25 year old all-star who's going to be your everything and Rashawn Holmes just doesn't fit anymore yeah it's weird uh things changed really quick for Rashawn in Sacramento it feels like last year it was anytime another big was on the floor that was not Rashawn it everything seemed to fall apart 
um, on on both ends of the floor, really. And this season, like last night, for example, which I think, uh, you know, you pointed out on 1320, like Rashawn was doing all the things of being a good teammate. And I think he was um, in good spirits the way that he seemed to be interacting with guys. But I do feel like there was a little bit, I mean, it was hard to not feel like, Holmes was going to be gone. This was going to be his last game in Sacramento. Um, and that ended up not being the case. But then, he, yeah, I mean, he plays those 11 minutes, 12 minutes uh, as a backup to Sabonis. And, yeah, I mean, it's he, he hasn't been the same this year. Um, I, I don't. He's had a complicated season with the eye laceration. He had a different eye injury even prior to that. And then um, he had a couple of games back maybe just kind of starting to get into a rhythm and then he goes into health and safety protocol and then now he runs into this situation with them acquiring Sabonis um, so Rashawn just has not quite looked like himself this year I don't know exactly what it is um, it's the last guy that I think I expected going into the year um, thinking that maybe this is who you see a lack of energy from and kind of feel checked out sometimes or discouraged um and yeah we, we've just seen that a little bit with Rashawn which is weird being the energy guy beforehand and I think that it could continue to feel frustrating if you were in his shoes it's like you're not a great rebounder I mean last night uh he gets put into the game in the first or second quarter when his first stint was and Minnesota instantly gets three offensive rebounds in one possession um, and like, that's just not Rashawn's skill set. Um, he d- doesn't have the size for it or things like this, but obviously Sabonis is great there. And I think like, yeah, just noticing those differences even more. So I, I think it's easy to underappreciate what Holmes does because you're witnessing Sabonis in his place. But Rashawn Holmes is still, I mean, having him as your backup center compared to what they were dealing with with the center rotation in years past is obviously a great situation when it comes to a talent um, standpoint, but we'll have to see how Rashawn kind of responds to this. And maybe there's a difference if you're past the deadline now, you know you're going to be here, but it, it's definitely interesting. I expected him to be gone. I did too. I mean, I, I, I talked to people within the organization and... The thought process is that they both play the center position. Sabonis and, and Holmes are both centers, um, which, I mean, Sabonis has played plenty of power forward in his career, but, I, like, look, it. there's no way to really play these guys together major minutes. Um, I, I think if anything, you can point to the Sabonis pairing with Miles Turner and say, well, that worked, but, again... Turner's ability to shoot the three changes the, it really a lot. Um, I, I think that having a shot blocker like Miles Turner would be would be great, but again, it, it didn't work there. They weren't good there. They they you know they bailed on that team because it just they they have 19 wins. They're they're not winning either. Uh, so like look, I, I think I agree that like what we're seeing here uh, that. Sabonis is is a five, right? Without any question, Rashawn is a five. I think uh, Rashawn's versatility. Um, number one, if he can act as a cutter, uh, if he can get in pick and rolls in different situations with uh, Sabonis, like there's possibilities there. And I also think that Rashawn's ability to track people on the perimeter, to defend the perimeter as a big, might lend you to believe that he it would work, but. I mean, Damian Jones has been really good. I think if you're going to push, like, I, that's why I'm really surprised. I'm, You know, they didn't find a deal that was to their liking or they didn't find a deal that, like, someone was willing to make today. Uh, but, Brennan, you kept all your first-round picks and now you have a starting-level center that had an off year, but you might be able to go out and shop at the deadline. And, I mean, shop uh, leading up to the draft and and go get another piece i think having him here and having him going in to the off season might not be that bad of a deal no um i mean if if the idea is again i, I don't think they fit well obviously like um what you pointed out I, I i would agree with that i think that they're both fives and playing them alongside each other especially with De'Aaron in any sort of lineup as well just 
probably is is not going to lead to ideal results. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you certainly can still get valuable assets for um, Rashawn if that's the idea in this offseason. He's got that four-year, uh, 47, I believe it is, million-dollar deal he just started this year. Um, so I, I think as long as there's not a like cloud hanging over Rashawn and this weird feeling surrounding him, which, again, he, he doesn't seem like the type of guy that, would have uh yeah some emotional way that he's responding to this situation but this year's just been a little bit weird for him um so yeah i think that it's it's interesting i i do think that there's a lot of moments recently that damian jones is just a better option um so that adds a complication alex len is a decent center in this league and he's just not playing like they have a really deep center rotation um so they have all the centers, all, all of, them. of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, like starting, uh, starting, uh, Matt Barnes said, uh, I'm, I'm just going off one in the chat. Uh, Matt Barnes said, Damian Jones is Kings best center. Um, I don't think he's their best center. Like clearly he's nowhere near the best at this point because you have uh, DeMontis Sabonis. Um, but Damian Jones was playing the best. And there is a distinction there. Their best centers were Sean Holmes. Sean Holmes just didn't play well. He had too many setbacks. Uh, I, I think he, along with half this team, got in their feelings like way too early in the season. Uh, you know, they didn't like the way that the whole thing spun out. We can say the same thing about Fox. We can say, say the exact same thing about Buddy Heald. Uh, we can say, again, I think Holmes fits right into their uh Harrison Barnes was great early. He went through a stretch where he seemed to like have some struggles. Uh, but I still think if you look at player for player, um, you know, Damian Jones is a quality NBA player and I, I like having him on this team. And I think he would probably be my choice to move forward as the backup center. But, but I still believe Rashawn Holmes is a better player. I've watched Rashawn Holmes for the last two years coming into this season. And he was absolutely like, a very, very good two-way center. He struggled with big, big centers, but outside of that, um, you know, his ability to switch, and I think he can be on a winning team without any problems, and I, I'm really surprised. Teams like like Toronto, like Charlotte, like uh, like there's a lot of teams that I think could have, like, come in here and, and got their hands on uh, Rashawn Holmes and made themselves better. Um, all right, let's get to it. The business of basketball. Um, this is a segment that we do every episode, uh, and it's usually sort of off the wall stuff. And because we have Brendan here for the first time, and Brendan's probably going to be on more than once, uh, but I, I think it's a really cool opportunity um, to kind of dig into how Brendan magically appeared, uh, because his uh, rise in the media world is it's really fun. Uh, and to be honest with you. It really reminds me of my own rise and and like the way that I found my way into the media world. And, uh, you know, I think that the interesting thing about media these these days is that you can start crafting and creating a voice for yourself before you you try to jump in. But that that first step of actually getting to go to a game and covering a game, it's so monumental, and uh, the cool thing about Brendan is that he jumps in with both feet. He asks questions, even if you know he he asks you know how to hide Tyrese Halliburton, and and that gets was my rest. best question all year, apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it may it was gold for you, but uh, like really, this is a it's a fun adventure. And Brendan, why don't you break it down? Because I, I don't even think I know the whole story of like how you like wander in off the street and next thing you know, you're Ty Halliburton's best friend. Yeah. Um, I mean, this year just went really fast, I guess. Um, was, yeah, just doing a lot of stuff with the Kings Herald guys. And I knew that credentialed, being credentialed and being at the game was like the next big step. I think I'd known that for about a year, um, but just didn't quite feel like I was there yet when it came to just the level of 
content I was producing or my understanding of basketball and, and just all of this really. Um, and then I, I think, uh, I, yeah, started to, okay, like, what is, what does this process look like if I do want to, when I eventually do feel comfortable doing this and kind of poking around, asking some of the King's Herald guys, um, got encouraged to, to do it and ended up shadowing, uh, Blake, uh, for who's a writer for the King's Herald that's Blake Ellington to, Blake Ellington yes uh at most games um and yeah I mean even even that whole process of trying to uh s- coordinate with media relations and explain who I am and uh I had a nicely enough of you had a 30 minute at or so, so phone call with you before going for my first day and trying to figure out how to ask questions I'm like pitching you questions to see how this is going to go um and yeah i mean i was like okay you're not gonna ask like a three paragraph yeah you know we're gonna cut that down what's your what's your thesis brandon what's your thesis brandon (laughs) but you did good you did good man yeah and it's yeah it's interesting i definitely felt a pressure of sorts and i think just placed on a pressure from myself of because you're either season long credential like yourself, obviously or Sean or people that have been around for a long time. Um, or they go game to game and you got to let them know, uh, you say 48 hours before each individual game. And, uh, with Kings Herald, it's kind of, we have one seat and if Blake doesn't happens to not be able to make it, then I take his seat. Um, but I, I think when I was first there and finally got through the door, I felt uh, or put a lot of pressure on myself of, okay, I have to make a good first impression because they got to approve me the next time. It's got to get approved every single time. Um, so maybe I forced a couple things here or there. Um, and I think there were a handful of questions asking that are maybe just like me learning the game or, um, I, yeah, I mean the game within the game, right? Like asking, there's so many times of um, obviously you know this, but I guess for listeners of like, if you're trying to get an answer out of a player, you can't just directly ask the question. You, you have to. Well, sort you of, can, you can, you can, but it doesn't usually work. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and it's just it, it's interesting, and it's all person to person, right? I mean, you hear so often like, oh, these these guys are people just like everybody else, and I, I think you know that going into it, but I think, I mean, like the interaction with Tyrese, for example, where it's like, this is, feels like I'm just talking to a friend of mine. Like, I think the extent of these are just normal, are are just people at the same time. You hear it all the time, but really feeling that was kind of different. And and it's the same thing when you're interacting with them, you know, you're not going to interact with every single person in the exact same way. It's all, um, what you communicate with each different, uh, person in, in relationship you have is all uh all changes based on what's going on and it's no different with with these sort of guys and yeah it's it's just definitely still a part of this whole uh still in in a learning curve here because you spent and you have a drive i it's so much time spent just going and being there like my the amount of content i was putting out i hit a I hit my own rookie wall recently, like two weeks ago, a week ago, because it's like, where am I supposed to fit in the time? Like any content that gets put out is going to be better because I have a better understanding and all of these um, situations of access conversations and so and so, but it's so much time put into it. You know, like I didn't understand that on game day, if, if we're going to shoot around in the morning, that I'm leaving at 10 o'clock um, and then getting back here probably 1130 just to end up leaving again at four for the game that doesn't start till seven. And then I'm getting home at like 1130. And where am I supposed to podcast in this time? When am I supposed to get my articles in? By the way, I still have a day job that's going on at the same time. So um it's all amazing and happened really fast. And I took it in a weird direction that you didn't ask me there. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's all great. It's just a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, I remember like my first days and for me, it was like, I had sent three emails to try to get into media day and, um, nothing, nothing, nothing. The third one, finally, I got a response and someone said, it was, uh, Darren May, the old, uh, media director for the Kings said, okay, I'm gonna let you in, but like, you gotta hear some ground rules. And I'm like, okay. So I got in and I'm like, I got okay. pulled aside by Rashawn, uh, by media yeah. relations the first day and was like, Hey, um, yeah, don't do X, Y, and Z. Don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. Don't cheer in the media box and do all these things. Well, don't ask someone for an autograph. Oh, well, I don't even think, I think that they, they think that you're smart enough not to do that. Um, <laughs> that has happened just so you know, um, where you're like, Oh no, you did not just do that. Um, but so, when I first started, it was like, I tried to get into media day. I finally got into media day and then I didn't know the next day was training camp. So I didn't go the, the next day, but then I found out it was training camp cause it's all over Twitter. So I reached out. I'm like, Hey, can I come to, to training camp tomorrow? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and come, but we're going to keep an eye on you. So I started in training camp and I just kept showing up and they kept looking at me like, are you going to keep showing up? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to keep showing up. And then, my I set goals to like get into a preseason game, and then next thing you know, I got per- credentialed for a media for for a preseason game. But it was the same exact thing where they're like, it's almost like um, you've seen the Princess Bride, right? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's it's like when Wesley is on the boat with Dread Pirate Roberts, and he said, uh, you know, sleep well. I'll probably kill you in the morning. <laughs> That's what it's like. You're just waiting for them to at uh, one day just say no, you can't come in anymore. And then you're like, oh, well, that was fun, but like now it's over. Well, it never ended. So, and what I didn't know is at the time, uh, I had started having conversations with Paul Westfall, the head coach, and we just like got each other like right away, almost like you and Ty, where you just had some instant relationship where it made sense. And you, I started having conversations with him. Paul went to media relations and told him to credential me and told him to keep letting me in the door that he wanted my voice in the room because it wasn't just like off the record conversations. I'm having off the record conversations where all the other reporters aren't because he wanted to hang out and chat with me and I wanted to hang out and chat with him. So we would chat and it just became like this really cool experience for me getting in the door. Um, And then they did the same thing every single week I had to, give a list of games that I wanted to go to, which was every game. And I went to every game that season. And then I think the next season, um, I missed one to go to the Sloan analytics conference. And the next season after that, I was in New York city when they decided the fate of the Sacramento Kings. Um, and I, those are the only two home games I've missed in 12 years. Uh, so I started out the same way you did. Uh, you, you put your toe in the water and you're like, is anyone going to bite my foot off? And when they don't, you slowly ease in. And then I'll like to be totally transparent with, like I've told Brennan this, uh, this season and I've told Frankie Cardcelli as well. This season specifically is, and there were moments before where like DeMarcus Cousins, there are moments like each of these things, like it's not the same every single day. There are certain things that happen in an NBA season that become like you go from like lower level college courses to like upper division college courses. And on all of a sudden you're like masters. Oh no, we've reached this as a PhD problem. Like you've got to really know what you're doing, what you're asking because situations change and get crazy when coaches so, are about to get fired. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. for me this year was um, when, like that Boston game, for example, or they're in this stretch of just losing bad like every single night. And I like like you said, I, I felt pretty comfortable when I first came in asking questions, um, like nervous at first, but kind of broke down that. And yeah, just asking things about the game and about the, 
product that we were seeing on the floor. And I think when it was the same issues over and over and over, live ball turnovers, rebounding, uh, we're not running, and all the exact same things, I definitely reached a point where it's like, I don't know what we're supposed to talk about right now. Um, and yeah, so I, I, that's like my slight taste of, yeah, like, okay, you can't you ask had the, about the game right now. You had the buildup too, where you're like, oh, everyone in the room knows that Luke Walton's about to get fired. Everyone feels it. You feel it. And like the tension is palpable. Everyone knows it. And then you got to ask questions about a game where they just got their ass kicked again. And so there are these moments where you're just really having this, uh, like this really interesting, but if you're, you don't know what you're doing, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to like be the guy who accidentally, you know, well, well, how long do you think you're going to be employed here? Like, so there's always these moments like throughout a season, especially with the Kings. I think with good teams, you don't really have a lot of these moments, but in Sacramento, it's always these moments. I mean, we've had two or three moments where uh, Alvin Gentry literally just started talking about his, how his team hasn't quit. And I mean, I've had to ask Alvin Gentry straight up, did your team quit? Like, it sure does look like some of your players have quit. Like, that's not an easy question to ask a, a professional basketball coach. But that's what I mean. Like, you're you're seeing that it's not just like repetitive motion. It feels like repetitive motion, but each of them start to have a different life of their own. Um, and then you'll get to a point where the last 25 games of a King season, typically they're not in it and it's just winding down and you're trying to get as much information as you can going into the off season. Cause you're not going to be around the players very much for like three months. And, and then a lot of them are gone, but even like the trade deadline, I think probably the harshest, harshest reality for a young guy you just faced where you had a, a outstanding relationship with somebody and they just got traded to Indiana. Ty, yeah, Ty told me the day before he got moved that uh, we were gonna we we're gonna play some two K on the way out of his presser, and little did I know he's going and doing a little interview with Sean. Um, but yeah, I mean, change change very fast. That's for sure. Yeah, Sean did a thirty minute video. You guys should watch it of of Tyrese Halliburton and Davion Mitchell just having a good time. Like we we posted on the last pod, but like that trade came out of nowhere, and you know it's like. You get used to some, certain things. I, I think people get very weird when I say, oh, yeah, I'm used to head coaches getting fired. Like, I think I'm on my eighth head coach. Um, Westfall, Smart, Malone, Corbin, Corbett, uh, Corbin, um, Carl, Jaeger, Walton, Gentry. My eighth head coach in 12 years. Um, and I there's a good chance I'll have a ninth next season. You just have to figure out how to like get into it and and, uh, and how to break down barriers quickly with with people and, and to develop relationships. And and I know someone mentioned you know R.I.P. Paul. Paul was a great man, just so everyone knows. Absolutely spectacular. Uh, during the off season, we met for lunch a couple of times. Um, his wife Cindy is amazing. Uh, I got Christmas cards from him. They're absolutely uh, just spectacular human beings and that it really horrible to see what happened to him and him passing and stuff but uh some of the greatest stories that you ever would possibly hear sitting down because that's a guy who like was on the celtics when they were great i mean that's a guy who's in the hall of fame who's one of the greatest like ambidextrous players that the game has ever known a guy who you know 25 point a game score just crazy crazy career in the game and uh and just a really really good man overall um, yeah, so, um, you know, you, I, I hope you stick with it. And this is something that you do for a long time, because I, I think the journey, it, it's so worth it. It's so I've had such a good time with it. And like, when you're old and gray, this is going to be what you talk about. Yeah, like, it, yeah. It, it's already like yesterday, when I'm sitting courtside, as like Sabonis comes out. And even, I think, a year ago, the idea of sitting courtside, at a, even for 10 minutes at watching shoot around would be crazy to me. Um, and I think sometimes I don't even quite realize. I have a friend that I started doing the Celtic stuff with um, who is uh, based in the UK, and I still talk to him pretty often. And every once in a while, because he's made a lot of progress also, like 
uh, we have to both be like, listen to what you just said and how crazy that is and what you would like if you told yourself that a year ago that this is what you would be saying right now, how ridiculous it is. Um, and it, it's it's great. And a lot of it is just showing up. And I think that that is show up. Yep. Sammy advice was 90 percent of the job is just showing up every day. Do and every every day is every day work every day every yeah, day you do all the time the job that's that's yeah. it you show up every day um and man why do I, why does everyone have crazy names on here orthus uh but does it pay um that just we're gonna end the king's beat podcast tonight and uh y- you need to go and subscribe to the king's beat <laughs> you need to go get a premium subscription uh sports writing doesn't pay great uh it takes a loyal spouse or uh a uh a really headstrong you know person who who works multiple jobs to make it work uh it's not the easiest uh, especially in a small market with a team that decides not to win for 15 straight years um so uh it's a <laughs> thank you he does subscribe to the uh the king's beat so um so anyway uh brendan thanks so much for joining me like i do this with sean every time um it's it's been a good time you're probably gonna come back and join me uh here and there uh going forward but um you know do you have any final thoughts um i think that getting uh, to kind of go back to some of the changes that we saw to the roster they added two or three three and d players and i think they had one before that like i I know that sabonis is is the big prize here but i kind of think that some of these complementary pieces could make make a decent difference uh this year and going into next and there's definitely a slight addition by subtraction thing going on with with some of these other guys i think at very least if if maybe it doesn't lead to more on-court wins, it makes the games a whole lot more watchable, at least at the current stage. And I guess also that um, beginning of this year, this same roster that we were talking about having a horrible vibe surrounding them right before the deadline um, seemed like they were feeling pretty good at the beginning of the year. They were, I think, 5-4 and four and played some high-level opponents. So um, while I'm optimistic and i think there's good reason to be i I think we're not going to really know what we have with the group until they um kind of hit some adversity and see how they respond from there that's right um so here's my final thought uh what is there eight home games left nine home games left nine i think nine um either either that or there's nine Uh, i don't know there's not that many home games left and uh my uh, my son came to the game on the actually he went to both games both minnesota games um, I'm going to suggest tickets are so cheap right now. Go out and find a ticket. I don't like upstairs, downstairs. I mean, you can get downstairs for so cheap right now, as opposed to normal, come and watch a game because my son was like very upset. He's a Kings fan. He was very, very upset about the, uh, Tyrese Halliburton trade and about three minutes into the first quarter, he texts me. Oh my gosh, he's a god. Watching DeMontis Sabonis in person is, I mean, if this is who he's going to be here in Sacramento, if he can play at this pace, if this is who he's going to be, man, you want to come watch him. You want to come watch a... Yeah, and attendance has been weird this year. Um, I I know Sacramento usually is, is great in that aspect, and it's just, you know, there's a lot of complications that I think lead to it this year, but... The energy in that first Sabonis game at Golden One Center was great. And we didn't know he was going to play until an hour at most um, before tip off. So, and, and you know, Justin Holiday was talking about it post game, how great the crowd was. And I think you get a little bit more momentum that you're, this Golden One Center is going to be going to be rocking again. That's right. And uh, I'll even mention Justin Holiday said, um, we got to get more than eight or nine home games. He's like, this was amazing. I uh, and I think we need to get these fans more than eight or nine home games to finish the season. And I'm like, well, look at that playoffs. We talk yeah. about playoffs. <laughs> Love it. 
All right. Uh, well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat podcast. Uh, make sure to subscribe. Make sure to give us thumbs up. Whatever the buttons are on whatever you're watching right now, because I don't know. I don't do Twitch and I like the Twitter thing. I, you got me. Like, subscribe, just hit all the buttons that say li- good. Yeah. There you go. Subscribe, yeah. like, follow, comment. Yeah. Yeah. But- And we're going to have this up on YouTube in just a few minutes. Uh, The audio file will be out as well very soon. Um, Thanks for tuning in. Get a premium subscription to the King's Beat podcast. Uh, The King's Beat overall uh, merch shop is coming probably early next week. And uh, you need to jump on board right now because uh, I think it's February 18th, eight days from now. Uh, No, seven days from now, 17th. Whatever it is, it's right around there uh, is the next happy hour. And uh, you don't want to miss a happy hour because the happy hour is the bomb and it's going to be a good time. So for Brendan Nunes of the King's Herald and King's Pulse, I am James Ham. Thanks for tuning in to the King's Beat podcast. See you next week.